Canadian IMF President of Business Week this year. We are excited to have Tricia Griffith, CEO of Progressive Insurance, with us today as the keynote speaker for Business Week 2018. We're looking forward to having her share her experiences and insights with us this afternoon. I also want to thank the entire Business Week team, as well as our faculty advisor, Steve Vandenberg, for all their hard work in putting this week of events together this year. I strongly encourage my fellow students to consider joining the Business Week team for next year, the 40th anniversary of Business Week at ISU. The application for the 2019 team is currently open and will be open until spring break. Interviews will be held in April. There are many opportunities available, and it's a great experience to not only develop yourself, but also assist in the development of other students within the College of Business. Information about getting involved can be found on our Business Week website, or you can ask any of the student team members here today. Lastly, I would like to thank the following sponsors who helped make this week of events possible. Nikor Gas, State Farm Insurance Companies, Archer Daniels Midland, Caterpillar, Country Financial, Amica Mutual Insurance Company, Centos, and John Deere Company. Now, I would like to introduce the Dean of the College of Business, Dr. AJ Smart. Thank you, Grant, and good afternoon. Welcome to the Illinois State University College of Business keynote speaker event. As many of you know, at the College of Business, we give our students a well-diversified portfolio of learning opportunities, many of them in the class and many of them outside the classroom. Business Week is a great professional development opportunity outside the classroom. Students get to meet business professionals, many of whom are our alumni, and with industry leaders. This week-long series of interactive events includes business etiquette, leadership development, networking, and career management. Today's event is a crown jewel of our annual Business Week program. We have the distinct honor and great privilege of having here with us our alumni, the President and CEO of the Progressive Corporation Insurance Group, Tricia Griffin. Tricia was appointed President and CEO of Progressive Insurance in July 2016. Her firm has $23 billion in annual revenue and employs 27,000 people. She is responsible for helping the company become the number one choice for auto and other insurances. Prior to serving as CEO, she served as Personal Lines Chief Operating Officer since 2015, overseeing the company's personal lines, claims, and customer relationship management groups. Tricia has a bachelor's degree from ISU and is a graduate of the Wharton School of Business Advanced Management Program. In 2016, she was named one of the 50 most powerful women in business by Fortune magazine. Please join me in welcoming Tricia Griffith. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. How is everyone? Good. Thank you for the turnout. I am so honored and privileged to be able to be here today. Uh, obviously, I graduated a while ago. It was over 30 years ago. I'm the class of 86. And coming here I got me a little melancholy, seeing a lot of the buildings that I recognized and a lot of things that have changed. But um, the one thing is I'm always honored to be an ISU alum and very um, honored to have been asked to be here today. So what I'd like to do, actually what I originally wanted to do was share my leadership principles. I've had leadership principles for quite some time at Progressive, and they've evolved over the years as I've evolved as a leader. And then I was thinking about, gosh, Progressive has been so much a part of my leadership. I want to talk a little bit about Progressive, even though Grant didn't listen. And I said, please don't mention State Farm, but he did. <laughs> um, no, actually, my brother is here, and he works for State Farm. And we're, we will be number one someday, but for now, State Farm's number one. <laughs> um, and I thought, you know, Progressive was such a big part. I want to share in the company and the culture that I believe has helped me to make me the leader I am today. And then literally, 
about three weeks ago, I woke up in the middle of the night and I was like, I'm gonna be at Illinois State. That's really where my leadership started. And I knew I had a box of memories and it took me a while to find it in my basement. But that's really where I wanna start, um, is my leadership and the things that I learned here at Illinois State. So this will bring me back uh, to, oops, I went ahead a little bit. This will bring me back a little farther. So I actually, for whatever reason, kept my freshman ID. So that's my freshman ID. I worked for the Alumni Association, and I was on uh, a float for some reason. I don't remember why, but there I was, and that's my uh, uh, graduation announcement. Uh, so my freshman and sophomore year, I went in. I actually went in as a psychology major and quickly moved to business. Lived in Hewitt 14 and then Manchester 5, because at that time Manchester was co-ed, so I was like, yeah. And I uh, decided to, had enough of Hewitt. And then I moved out to an apartment and, you know, was just living life, working at Ram House, which was the Alumni Association at the time, and um, my junior summer, um, everything changed, and I decided that I would interview to be a preview guide. And this was the first time I'd ever been nervous for an interview. So I'd worked retail my whole life, and I was really nervous because I really wanted to do this. And I got the job, and it was a life-changing summer because I realized then that if you do things and, and, and lead with your values, you can really influence people. So I loved having the new incoming students, talking to them, talking about the fears that happen on your first Sunday night at college, also all those things that you don't always get to share, you don't know, and you feel alone. And I really love that. And I actually kept a letter from the coordinator that talked about um, how even the other preview guides sought my guidance. And so I knew this was something that would be a part of my life. I didn't know to what capacity, but I knew it would be a part of my life. Something else significant happened that summer. My dad died, and I knew I had to change gears. So here I was, preview guide, halfway through. In July, my dad died, and I knew that I couldn't afford to continue to go to school without doing something different. I'd already had school loans. I was moving out to an apartment, and so I just had to change gears, which was the first time I had to think about being nimble and being flexible. And I, I use that all the time, and, and really my dad taught me that. So I decided to move out of the apartments and back into the dorms, and I was an RA in Watterson Towers, which was a big difference. It's not great to go back to the dorms after you've already been out, but I knew it was the right thing, and I, I, I was, when I was going there, I was like, ah, I don't want to do this, and it was one of the best decisions of my life. Again, another evolution of learning and um, really understanding who I am and what I wanted to be uh, as I got older. I thought you'd want a close-up of that cute dress, so I, I, I zoomed in because I know you're jealous, but we actually picked those. Those weren't even given to us. We actually chose to wear those all summer. You'll also notice that the ID is different. So I had my initial freshman ID, and this is the one I got as a preview guide. You can tell I'm very happy I'm wearing the same outfit, actually my preview guide outfit. But I had a second ID in between, and I don't know if this place still exists, but if it does, I lost it at Pub 2. And so if there's like a 1985 lost and found, that's where you'll find my second ID. So whoever finds it, there's a, there's a prize. Um, let me talk a little bit about my start of Progressive before I go into um, more about the business. I'm not going to go into too much, so, so don't worry about it. But um, I went to a job fair here. I'd always worked retail, and so I started initially after college with a company called Furrow Building Materials. Think of it like a Home Depot. I don't think it's in business anymore, but it took me to Indianapolis, and I went in there, and I was a management trainee, moving around a lot, moving my way up, and I was thinking, I have a marketing major from Illinois State. Do I really want to do this? I know how to mix paint. Um, I'm a forklift certified driver, so if you need a tub enclosure moved, I'm your girl. Um, but I didn't really want to do that. I remember vividly one evening driving home with my hard hat on my, in my passenger seat thinking, I want to do something different. I want to use the skills that I learned in college. And this will age me, but I answered a classified ad and I heard it was progressive. And so I made the phone call for a claims rep trainee. So basically crawling under cars, estimating cars, and meeting with injured people. And, but it sounded exciting, and I thought what I would do is get this job and um, pay off some of my school loans and then go and get my MBA. Uh, so I started with the company. First I called my mom and said, I quit my job and I'm, I'm working for Progressive. And she said, oh, the soup company. And I'm like, no, that's Progresso. 
Um, so it wasn't very well known. It was about a billion dollars, and now we're actually, um, uh, since we sent that bio, we're headed up to almost $30 billion of revenue. So we weren't even one billion at that point. So it was a company we didn't know. I went into the claims office, and I want to say maybe six or eight months into that job, I fell in love. I fell in love with the people, with the culture, with the fact that every day I learned something new. I fell in love with our values. I could be at a place where you could be yourself. And so to me, I've never looked back. And there was a pivotal point really early on in my career. So progressive. Uh, we have an overarching um, objective, and that is um, have a 96 combined ratio, which just means for the, for the business students, every dollar of premium that comes in, we want to make at least four cents of underwriting profit. We want to do that while we grow as fast as we can. And the only caveat being is we don't want to grow if we can't make sure we take care of our customers, whether it's sales or service or on the claims department. So in the last couple of years, in 2016, uh, when I started the role as CEO, we grew 2.8 billion and hired 6,600 people. Last year, we grew another 3.8 billion and hired 6,000 people. So when you have that amount of movement, you've got to be really careful to be savvy enough to hire well in advance to make sure you can take care of your customers need, especially when they need you most when they have a claim. And so that's really our priority. Uh, we are um, high frequency, low tail, so that means we have a lot of claims, um, but they're um, low, free, low severity, which is low in cost, and short tailed, so they, they're handled pretty quickly. But that's sort of the gist of Progressive. So you'll hear from us from the time we went public in 1971, whenever you hear me speak to our investors, I talk about 96 combined ratio, grow as fast as we can. And we've had that written in our annual report every year, and it will continue to be written in my letter this year. Uh, the great part about Progressive, and you're going to see this throughout both my leadership principles and just when I talk about Progressive, is our five core values. And they really are uh, part of everything we do. They're not posters on the wall. They're something we live every day. And so we talk about them every day. In fact, um, I attend every new hire class, which is almost once a week. And I do that solely to introduce myself to every new hire at Progressive and let them know how important our values are. So that's very important to me. And they're just, they're really something special. We're a unique culture. We have a really diverse art collection. Uh, Peter Lewis, who was our second CEO, we've had four CEOs. He was our longest CEO. His dad actually started the company. He was the founder. He started this art collection actually with his ex-wife. And we have just crazy art throughout the company. It really makes for great conversation, even if it's sometimes a little spicy. In fact, early on, Peter bought um, the faces of Mao, so Chairman Mao, the Andy Warhol faces, and people were outraged. You know, this is a person, the leader of the Communist Party, he's done horrible things, and they signed a petition, and they sent it to Peter and said, we, we need this to come down, this is not our culture, and so Peter bought a second set. Because it happened, and those, though you have to have those conversations, and it really helps with us with diversity. Uh, we have a huge, talented bench strength, which I'm, I'm really proud of, um, yet we're pretty flat from an organization, which makes, makes you able to be lean. And in this business, you have to be cost-effective because you can give that cost to your customers to grow. Those are the companies that win. Um, from a transparency perspective, we're the only Fortune 500 company that produces results on a monthly basis. Um, it means we're always ending a month. So most companies, all companies, do it on a quarterly basis except for Progressive. We want to be transparent and let our owners know um, within 30 days the next month's results. Uh, we are a stats quant factory. Um, we have a huge objective in terms of um, getting as much data as can, we can and we'll disregard stuff we don't need. So literally we measure everything. Um, segmentation is also the name of the game when you're in, when you're, you're in insurance to be able to understand um, and, and, and understand how to price people with their loss experience and the loss cost. So for us, this is a huge objective is to be able to measure everything. This is what we call our, our four cornerstones. So I've already talked about core values, um, who we are. Um, we now have a purpose statement, which is why we're here. We have a vision where we're going, and we have a strategy of how we're going to get there. To us, those are really important. Um, I talked about the core values there, integrity, golden rule, objectives, excellence, and profit. Uh, our purpose statement was something we just started last year. We had a mission that 
Peter had written part of, Glenn, my predecessor, had written part of, and then I wrote part of. And it started to be kind of what we did, and it became really verbose. And so my team and I decided we really wanted to say, you know, why we're here in terms of a purpose statement. So we came up with about 15 ones that we thought were really brilliant and pithy statements. We sent it out to the organization, and like 100 people in the organization, they're like, no, none of them. And so we decided to go a different route, and we had small groups throughout the company come up with different purpose statements and why they liked them and what they liked about them. And then we narrowed it down to two and had all 34,000 of our employees vote on those. And so the one that won was true to our name, Progressive. And we feel really passionate about that because that to us is bringing everything you are to your work every day and making sure you make the lives of our customers better and each other better. Our vision, uh, the Dean said, is to become consumers' number one choice and destination for auto and other insurance. And our strategy really is around being cost effective, having a great brand, and being where, when, and how people want to buy. Our target market. So marketing, when you think about that in terms of insurance, it's usually people talk about non-standard, preferred, ultra-preferred. We really wanted to put personas around our, our, uh, the people that we serve. And so you'll see these people, and you've got Sam, Diane, the Wrights, and the Robinsons. So Sam is our sort of non-standard. We, we, we nicely call him inconsistently insured. And we like Sam as long as we can make that 96 combined ratio. And a lot of, a lot of people will be Sam's in their life at some point. Um, Diane, actually, we have the most Dianes. And she is a, and remember, these are kind of you know, gender neutral. She is a renter that has our auto. And what we want her to do is to be able to um, graduate with us as she gets married, as she buys a home, as she has children. So Diane, we really concentrate on graduating her to a Robinson. The rights are unbundled, so they have our auto in someone else's home. And again, once they, they um, come into Progressive, once they have our service, we hope that they'll also change and have all their products with us. And the Robinsons are sort of our nirvana. The Robinsons are our auto home bundle. We bought a homeowner's company called American Strategic Insurance a couple of years ago. It'll change over to Progressive Home Insurance this year. But those bundled customers we know are sticky, and um, we have a lot, more, a lot more to offer them. So that's really our approach to marketing. And that, that way, we can very surgically target market, even if it's mass media, but especially in a digital place, we can target each of these with different messages that resonate with them. Um, the customer experience is real important. I'm not going to go through all of these, but years ago, about 20 years ago, we decided to put our rates out with the rates of other companies, even if ours wasn't the lowest. And we did that, again, because we're transparent and we wanted to be able to provide customers um, with all the information they needed to make the right choice. And it was funny, a lot of times, even if our, what, ours wasn't the lowest, they would actually buy Progressive because of that. So we saw, we saw thinking about the customer as a great experience. Uh, we were the first to do um, usage-based insurance. You'll know it as snapshot from our commercials, but it started years ago as autograph, and it's transitioned based on technology. And actually, I should uh, update the slide because we do most of it now on a mobile device um, in order to um, have an algorithm around how you drive. And for us, that that's benefits the customers because people can get pretty huge discounts depending on um, how they drive. Just recently, um, we uh, put out something called Home Quote Explorer, which is being able to go online very easily to do a home quote, which is usually really cumbersome. And you'd be surprised. I sit with reps, and somebody else, the rep will say, what kind of roof do you have? And people are like, like, it's like this. You know, I mean, I don't know what kind of roof. So we try to make it really easy for people and buy publicly available data to provide that with them. And then recently, we... Uh, we rolled out what we call a flow bot, a chat bot with Fe Facebook Messenger um, to be able to have your auto policy. So we're always trying to think of the future and technology, which I think is really important. Cars not cash. This is really about the claim service. So to me, this is this is the really the only tangible thing we have. So when you see our commercials, you'll see in that we call it the superstore, the boxes that we have. We do that because it makes insurance tangible. But really, our product is helping you when something happens. And people don't want to check. They want their car back in the driveway. They want to feel better. They don't just want to say, hey, you deal with this. And we realized that many years ago and have always strived to be a really, really incredible claim service. It's always, you're, you're always going to have to work on that. But to us, that's really important to be able to make sure that we take care of our customers. 
for years, I ran claims. I was the president of claims for about six years. And when I was in that department, I realized just how important it was listening to customers and, and having been a claims rep and listening to the devastation that happens. And I always talk to my, to my team about, you have to think of this. Everyone's going along their day. They're going to work. They're going to school. And the last thing they want to do is have an accident. It's a deductible. Maybe someone's hurt. They don't have their car. It's really a hassle. It's actually really um, unnerving. It's, it's really stressful. And to me, our job is to remove that burden. Nope, this is what you paid us for. Let, let us help you. And I always talk about it, you know, pretend like a roommate's moving and they've got boxes. You wouldn't have them carry all the boxes. You'd say, let me take care of that. Ironically, I'd never been in an accident until about three years ago. And I was on the way home from our lake house with my son, Jack. Um, he was driving. It was early, like a six o'clock on a Monday morning, really rainy. And we're driving along. It's in a, our lake house is kind of in the country. We're driving this country road, 55 miles an hour. And all of a sudden, boom, a deer hits the fender, the hood. And it was really unnerving. Has anyone had a deer hit? They're scarier than you think. And I think as a claims rep, I was sort of like, that's really easy because there's no coverage and liability. I kind of use that as kind of a, a factory thing. It's really, really scary. So this deer goes, it's to the side, it's dead. He pulls over, does a really nice job. The car's a wreck. He is this, uh, he's a sophomore in college football player, this big kid. And he's sitting there and all of a sudden he said, I killed another living creature. And I was like, we have a thousand dollar deductible. <laughs> Both are true, um, but here's what happened. I sat there, and remember, I started as a claims rep. I sat there, and he said, Mom, what do we do? I was in the passenger seat, and I was like, I'm not sure. And he was like, don't you do this? Like, what have we been doing all these, these 30 years? And it's, I, was, I like had to think about it. I had to think of the number that I had to call, and I was in the team that made up the 800 number. I mean, I know that like the back of my hand which made me even realize even more, someone who knows this is a deer hit, so we didn't hit anybody else, we weren't injured, how important it is to be able to live the product that you write. Uh, brand, whether you like her or don't, you know her. So Flo has been our spokesperson, uh, actually this year it's 10 years. And um, brand is really important. And we learned that when we started. And we had some fits and starts, and not everything's perfect. But uh, this is a big industry. There's probably about 300 private passenger auto companies. But you know the ones with the brand. You know the top five or 10 that, that are able to get their brand out there, which is really important. Um, we continue to evolve our brand based on the marketing mix I talked about. So Flo in the Superstore, the majority of time has been about savings. And she's kind of quirky and fun. And she kind of represents who we are. Are. We've evolved and it, uh, uh, we have a little bit less of her in the superstore and different characters and then we just recently evolved about a year ago to having no flow commercials that we call parentamorphosis. So it's when you buy your first home, you become your parents. And so it's been very fun using lines from my parents to, to use in those commercials, but those don't have any flow. And those are really for the Dianes and the Robinsons who have a home and want to be protected. And we can still have a mark there, so you always link it to Progressive. We have a mark that we own called Flotection, and you can mark it there, but there's no flow. So to me, it's really about making sure you have uh, target markets and a brand that is known. Okay, so that's progressive in a nutshell. I could talk about it for a long time because I've been here 30 years and I've had a lot of opportunities. But wherever you are, whether I ran HR or claims or was the chief operating officer, it's really about leadership. The jobs that all of you are going to be in, no matter if you're an individual contributor or a leader, it's about leadership. It's about making sure you exude your values, that you make the people around you feel great, that you bring out the best in people, and that you're able to bring your whole self to work every day. So let me get started with some of my leadership principles. And again, these have evolved over the years. Uh, my, my biggest role is to create a great culture of trust at Progressive and continue to do that. It starts with new hire. So I'm at new hire class, but I always invite people to call me for coffee or come up and talk if they, ha if they need advice. I do that um, weekly with a lot of, with a lot of um, employees. I also, every Friday, uh, I usually bring my lunch because I've got a lot to do. Every Friday, I go down to the cafeteria and randomly walk up to a table of people that are sitting there. If there's an extra t seat, I'll say, do you guys mind if I sit with you? And usually they're like, 
uh, <laughs> and they can't say no. And so I sit with them, and by the end, like I know who they are, where they're going, and then I have fast friends. So every Friday I get to have four to six new fast friends, and it makes a difference because for them now, they know I'm approachable. And that to me is the most important thing. I can't sit in Cleveland with my head in the sand, know what's going on with many different demographics without having people feeling really comfortable with me. It's also about admitting mistakes. When you make a mistake, talk about it openly because then people realize that mistakes are okay, covering them up or not. So to me, this is really important. I also, for the last probably 15 years, in different roles. Um, every um, couple months in the summer, I have a forum. So now it's a CEO forum. It used to be a claims forum. And I'll have people in for a day, and we'll, talk, we'll have debates. We'll talk about diversity topics. And then I have them to my home for dinner. And it's always nice to break bread with people because then it really brings you closer together. And I do this in really small groups. This is an important part of our culture. Uh, leverage your values and convey your character. Uh, these are our core values that I named before. You have to talk about your values, but then you have to live them, and they have, it has to be part of your character. So I talk all the time that progressive is not number one in my life. Um, I absolutely, uh, I'm, I have faith, family, and progressive, but my family is really important to me. I'm the mother of six children. We have a his, hers, and ours, and so to me, that's always been really important, so that balance is important. Uh, and I travel out a lot to talk to people. I was in New Jersey um, a, a couple years ago, meeting with a group of a couple hundred claims people in the middle of the state. So we all met in like a Holiday Inn, a big conference room. And I was speaking from three to five, like it was on a Wednesday. And uh, before I spoke, I thought I should use the restroom. So I was in there and I was washing my hands and this young woman came up to me and said, um, do you work at Progressive? And I said, yeah. And she said, I just started here. I came from another carrier. I started here Monday. I heard Trisha Griffith's gonna speak. I said, yeah, I, I heard that too. And, and she said, um, I don't know what to do because I need to leave at five. Do you think she'll end on time? I'm like, no, she is a chatty Cathy. And she's like, I said, well, what's up? And she said, well, I have uh, my daughter's first communion. I was interviewing for the job. My husband's out of town. And I, I really, I need to leave at five to make it to her first communion practice. And I said, well, I happen to know she's been to six first communion practices. And then she's like, stalker. Um, and I said, what I would do is I would sit towards the end and leave if she's not done at five. And so I went to leave and I'm like, I can't do this to this poor girl. I said, by the way, I'm Trisha Griffith. <laughs> and the reason I tell that story is because I wanted her to know day three, what was important to her was important to me. So whether it was first communion practice or watching the Olympics or coaching your son or daughter soccer team, whatever it is, you have to have something important outside to have that balance. And to, 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 to me, that's really important to let everybody know. And uh, I continue to um, openly talk about that and make sure people know um, that I feel that way about whatever it is that they have outside of their life, outside of Progressive. When values aren't just a poster. So in um, 95, when, 2005, when, when Katrina happened, um, that was you know, one of the biggest, uh, biggest storms. And it was different because usually water comes and then it, then it recedes. And this was different because the water stayed there. And so as a claims rep, you make judgments of, is it fresh water, salt water, how do you do it? This was very different because the water was there and we really didn't know what was in the water, but we did know over time that it was sewage and we saw dead animals, et cetera. So as an insurance person, you total those cars and then you sell some of the parts for salvage and you get that amount. And it's usually, on a normal total loss, it could be up towards a 23%. Um, this we knew would be a little bit less, but we went down there and we saw the, the carnage, for lack of a better word, and we, couldn't, we, we could not wrap our minds around knowing that those cars could possibly be out somewhere in the world. Could someone fix those up and sell those, and some young person in Omaha is driving that, and, and what would happen to it? And so we made a decision as a company, even though it was millions of dollars, to crush every one of those cars. And so we crushed them so not even the sheet metal would be used because we just, we just couldn't get our arms around the fact that what if something happened and things can happen with salvage titles and one of those cars would be out there. We literally lost millions, but we knew it was the right thing to do. And that's what matters when you have values. Values are really easy to write and put on a poster, but when push comes to shove, do you live them? 
Communicate what you know when you know it. Uh, to me, this is so important to communicate over and over again. And I think more importantly, do that when something isn't going well. Uh, so in 2008, during the financial crisis, uh, you know, things had happened. Our frequency of accidents had plummeted. Gas prices rose, so people also weren't driving. We had lost money on our investment portfolio. And um, at one point, I had to do a reduction in force. And those are the, the hardest things you can ever do as a leader. And part and of that for me part was, of that for me was communicating all along where we were, what was going to happen, giving people options, trying to figure out how we could salvage every vehicle. But I know even though it wasn't a great situation, that people appreciated the fact that we were honest and open and I communicated what I knew when I knew it so that they weren't they weren't feeling left out. Think broadly. Uh, another, another attractive picture. picture. I gotta get some good pictures for you guys. Um, so this is uh, when I went to Wharton a few, three years ago, three summers ago. I, I talked to our board of directors and said, I'd like to, I didn't ever end up getting my MBA, so I wanted to do sort of the crash course, and there was a six-week course uh, at University of Pennsylvania, and so I went there, and each week they did something leadership. So I was away from my family for six weeks. Um, this actually was one of the most incredible times, and it was uh, working with the New York City Fire Department in Randall Island in New York City. It was a super hot day. We all went there. Um, there was 42 of us that were together for six weeks. Um, very few were from America. It was very diverse. It was really incredible. And literally, I keep in touch with these people. On a daily basis, we're on WhatsApp. So we kind of become like our, our board of directors because I've become so close. This day in particular, uh, I was with, on my team was Sean, who's super tall at the end, and another guy named John, who's not in the picture. Um, most of the teams had two. We ended up having three. There was a series of, of exercises we would do. The first one, they had a maze that was really close to the ground. And you had to have the fire equipment on and crawl through it. And I'm a little bit claustrophobic, and I'm pretty tall. These guys are much taller. I'm like, oh, I, do, I can't be in the middle. I got to call first. And immediately, Sean's like, I, I got to be in the front. And John's like, I got to be in the back. So I was stuck in the middle. And um, it was a maze that you had to get through, really hot. And I kept thinking, you know what? No one's probably died here. Just get through it. And so Sean said, you know there's something up here. We're not just going to go through a maze. So I'll figure out what's, what they're going to do. So he's feeling around. And he said, I'll kind of, I'll lead the way and yell back if there's something. I said, great. And uh, John, who yelled, I can't be in the back, said, OK, I'll hold Trisha's foot, which was even wor you know, worse. I'm going through this thing. So Sean's there. John's there. We're going through. We get through. I'm trying to memorize the maze because I think maybe they're going to switch the maze. I've had all these things going on in my head. So we get out, sweaty, high five. We got through. It was great. And they're like, OK now put the, the air on and the mask on because you're going to go in again, but have a conversation before you go in. So Sean said, um, they're going to throw something at us. I, I wonder if they'll have smoke or something. And the, the, the guy from the New York City Fire Department said, oh yeah, we'll, de we'll definitely have that, so don't even worry about that. And I said, I think, we're, I think they're going to move the maze because I've memorized it in my head. You know, what do you think? And John said, I'll hold Trisha's foot. <laughs> so, so we're going through the maze, and Sean yells something like a bump, I think, but I can't hear because they have piped in people, too, it's that kind of screaming. So Sean yells something, and we get through. I, they don't change the course. High five, we're done. What we had missed early on in the maze was a um, fake baby. And what that led me to is this new uh, leadership principle, and that is think broadly. You always kind of decide what's going to be. And in business, there's always glitches around the corner that you have no idea about. So if you always try to figure out this is going to happen and this is how I'll react, you should have plan A, B, and C. But um, thinking broadly is really important, especially with how much technology is changing and how quickly technology is changing, you have to always be thinking broadly. And um, I felt really blessed to be able to go to that six weeks because it did change my thinking. It made me, because I've only really truly worked at one company for over 30 years, allowed me to think broadly and differently even though I've been with the same company. Sometimes small gestures matter the most. So um, at the end of Wharton, we had a formal graduation. And because most of the people weren't from the States, um, during the, the last week, they had spouses and children come, came in, and they would have events for them. And then there was a formal graduation. I was asked to do this commencement speech at our graduation. And at that time, Jack was just turning 18. We still had Nick at home. Things were going on. And I said to Greg, my husband, I'm like, don't come, because you've got to be with Jack on his birthday. Uh, 
you know, we don't, you know, we've been to Philadelphia, people are going to be touring, we don't need to, to necessarily do that. And I went back and forth, um, but we made the decision as a couple that he wouldn't go because it, it didn't matter um, in terms of that. I'd rather have him be at home with the kids, I should say. And so that day, one, I'm kind of regretting it because everybody has their whole families with them. And um, so I had called my boss, the, our prior CEO, Glenn, probably two weeks before, and I said, I was asked to do the commencement speech. Um, can you give me words of wisdom? And he's like, make it short, do this, do this. And so he gave me some words of wisdom, and I, I prepared a speech that just kind of went on five or six bullet points. And so we're standing there before the pomp and circumstances, kind of talking, and all of a sudden, someone kind of edged up to me, kind of invaded my personal space. <laughs> and I looked, and you know when you see somebody that they're not supposed to be in the place they're supposed to be, and it takes a while to like, duh, 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 and it was my boss. He flew in for the commencement speech because he knew I was going to be alone. And I said, oh, I love you. And he said, um, never say that again. <laughs> Um, but I had to change my whole speech because when I talk about values and culture, having the CEO of a company come that he doesn't have kids, he doesn't, you know, he didn't really know about it. I think he, my assistant maybe had told him, yeah, no one's going or whatever. But the fact that he took the time out of his day to come to my graduation um, was really telling. And again, those are things that people remember. Small gestures matter. So think about that through your life as you're in business, as you're a parent. Uh, as your uh, a spouse, as your significant other, the small gestures matter. So when you think about it, if you think about writing a note or doing something, just do it. <laughs> Encourage healthy debate. Um, for me, this is so much fun. At my table, I always talk about debates. I always talk about the contrary contrary view. In fact, when I know someone has a really firm view, I make them take the opposite one because I think it makes all of us better. If I was there to make every decision, I could just do that without a team. I need my team. They need their teams all the way down. So for me, having great debates, one, just makes things fun and it makes everything better. And I'm always very clear with my team if I have more than one vote, and that's very rarely. The power behind um, having a debate, though, is unity is making sure at the end you walk out as a unified team. So have the great debate, and then don't come out and roll your eyes and say, well, I would have done it this way. Even if the, the end outcome doesn't work, create that unity because that's what builds teams. Your actions should match your words. So I talk a lot about family. I didn't always talk a lot about family, I should say, but um, probably 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I felt a little bit more comfortable talking about family at work. Uh, I think when I grew up in claims, it was, I was, there weren't very many women, and I felt like that would be a sign of weaknesses, which I regret. Um, but I always talk about how my family is so important. And, um, but your, your actions have to match your words. So if you say that, yet you give someone some work when they're on vacation with their family, then they're, they're not going to believe it. Um, this, this interview for the CEO role uh, was over the span of several years. And uh, I had a series of interviews with um, the board, and um, I had one final interview with them. It was a two-hour interview to kind of say, here's what I would do, here's what I would take progressive to the next step, here's all the thoughts in my mind. So it was, it was the finale of, of, and I wasn't the only one going for the job. So I'm very nervous about it. Um, that same year, my son was a um, senior in high school, and his football team was, was moving on. They, they went to the playoffs, which was really great. This team had never done this. This school had never done this. And um, the day after Thanksgiving, the whole family got together. We went to the final playoffs game. They made it to the state championship. They're playing at Ohio State. This is so exciting. Exactly at the same time as my final interview for CEO. So I have every board member coming in, really important people from all around the country to sit with me for two, three hours, have my final interview. And uh, where I live, Ohio State's about two hours away. And I literally, that night I was like, <sighs> and Jack was all excited. And I was like, this is easy. I'm not gonna miss Jack's game. If I'm not the CEO, I can live with that, but I couldn't live not going to his game. This is like, this is something that I've, I've told him, you know, he's excited about. I've told him I, I wouldn't miss. And I texted Greg or uh, Glenn and said, you know, unfortunately this happened. I need to withdraw from uh, the CEO uh, job. And I regret that, but I also understand that because these people are important. And, and, um, and I also thought they could be thinking, is she really in it? You know, if she in it, if, she, if this is so important to her.
Um, and so immediately Glenn called and said, no, 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 let me do some work. And between he, other candidates, and everyone else, people finagled it so I could finish everything by four that day and get home and get to the game uh, when it started. Um, and they won. So, um, so to me, this is, um, you, you have to live what you say. So you can't say, this is really important. Now, does that mean you're not going to miss things? Um, I never make the coffees at 10 o'clock in the morning um, at the kids' school. That's just, I've, I've accepted that. And I actually just talk to my children all the time about what's the most important thing to you. And that's why I knew how important this was to him. Lead and know when to get out of the way. Uh, this, is a, this is a work in progress for me because I love getting down in the details. And so for me, I have a great team. They all know what they're doing. Um, for me, sometimes it, it just, I have to have them call me out and feel comfortable calling me out. Just recently, I um, got excited about something I thought we should do. And I called one of my direct reports. He wasn't there, so I started calling his. I'm like, what do you guys think? You know, and we were going on and on. And at the end of the day, I thought, that's not my job. I should have talked to Pat, and then Pat would have done it had he thought it was good. But I get so excited about it. So I do, um, the one thing I tell my team to do is let me know when I'm getting in the way because I hired them for a reason, and they're all really good at what they do. Give credit and take blame. Uh, so when I was introduced, you know, you, when you get to this level, you get accolades. Uh, most powerful woman, blah, blah, blah. I don't get those. Those 34,000 people got me those. And so if you ever think that you get on those lists because of one person, that's just a fallacy. I, I get those because every single person working so hard, answering the phones, going out and seeing claims, our actuaries doing, making the right decisions on our reserving, um, those are the people that, that give me those accolades. They get the credit. Things go wrong. Things are going to go wrong. If something goes wrong and there's always that glitch I talked about around the corner, when that happens, I take the blame because I lead the company. And you have to live those um, attributes as a leader. Uh, honor the room. So um, I started out by thanking all of you for coming here. Um, it really is an honor. And I don't take that um, gr lightly. I, I think it's really... Um, uh, I think it's really important for everyone to know how I feel about uh, the importance and the fact that you all invited me. So I want, I want you to know that. And so whether the room is two people that are sitting in my office or the people that come to my forums at home or all of you that, that came out uh, today, I really appreciate it. And you should always make sure you honor the rooms you're in. And last but not least, um, management uh, comes from anywhere. Um, I mean, leadership, I'm sorry, management comes from hierarchy. Leadership um, uh, comes, what, what am I saying? Leadership comes from anywhere. So you can be an individual contributor, um, you can be a leader. When you get direct reports, that does not make you a leader. What makes you a leader is when people want to follow you. And that's how you know you're a leader. So don't ever think because you get that first management job and you're doing evaluations and you've got direct reports that you're actually a leader. You're really only a leader if people want to follow. So now I'd like to open it up for um, some Q&A. And I think um, Grant's going to bring the microphone down so everyone can hear. And we're going to have some runners. But would love to hear what's on your mind. Uh, and you can ask anything. Hi, Trisha. My name is Lauren. Hi, Lauren. Um, first of all, I want to say you said a lot of great things today, and I'm grateful that you were able to be here. Thank you. And my question is, how, what is your advice to best market yourself to employers? That's a great question. You know, I think, for, first of all, think about all the things you've achieved. So when I think about uh, the business students that put that on, I don't think even with my resume at Progressive, when I've gone for jobs, I kind of um, may say, oh, that's not that, that important. But it was important. And even as I thought back to, to this event, thinking about, preview guide. That was, an, that was something that helped me. RA, all those things. So make sure you are confident in saying what you've done and what you've done well. Um, also, go in there confidently. Um, I will say that, and I talked a little bit about not talking about my children as much, I don't think I really found my confidence until maybe 10 years ago. And, you know, Embrace who you are, what you're bringing, be confident, and don't always worry for your first job if you have all the requirements. And that, that was a huge learning for me, even within Progressive. I would wait to go for jobs until I was completely ready. Go for things that maybe are a little bit riskier. Uh, I, I would not have this job 
um, but for getting the head of HR job. I would not have the head of HR job but for a bunch of, I would call them advocates and sponsors, calling me and saying, you should go for HR. And I'm like, I don't have any HR experience. I have a marketing degree and I have claims. And so many people with, from, without the com within the company, whether it was direct reports or people I worked around, said, you know, you should go for it. And I finally went for it. Um, I didn't have um, enough confidence. I didn't see in myself what others saw in me. So make sure you go and confidently and see, see in yourself. And then lastly, um, as, you, as you start to interview, uh, don't, you always want to be concerned about getting the job, but interview them. Because you want to work for a company that has cultures that align with you. And you don't want to get the job for just to get, to get, just to get the job. So to me, be confident and kind of say, wow, I thought this was exciting, but that person, if, if, they're, if they represent this company, it's okay to say no. Thank you, Lauren. I think there was somebody at well. So as I understand, Andy Warhol was actually a very devout Catholic and went to Mass every day. So I see what you did there. It's very interesting. He is a Catholic, he's a Chinese communist leader to promote the traditional values of an artist. Very interesting. Uh, but I'm, seriously, what I want to ask is, in the context of the debate uh, that you were talking about, how do you deal with a situation where you have conflict or strong conflict of values which you can have? I, I read recently that Japanese says that what they do with Amazon is they say, okay, here are the things where we disagree with, but here is the part that we disagree with, that we agree with. We, this is what we can do together. Let's do this together. Right. I wonder how you view this. Because as a country right now, we're not doing very well with this idea of really clashing values we need to work on that. Yeah. Um, you know, I think what, what we've been talking about as a leadership team is, and especially with the divisiveness that's, that's been in, in, in the country, is one, you know, you're going to have to give a little. And to get things done, you have to give a little. And it's not always going to be exactly the way you want it. Almost anything that I bring to my team doesn't come out exactly how I how I portrayed it. I, I'll draw a blueprint for something and they'll say, you didn't think about this. So to me, you've got to be self-aware and confident enough to go, oh, that's a better idea and to understand that. And I think once people see that um, leadership really does that and they live by those values, they want to actually do that as well. So I think it's talking a lot as well. I think it's talking about things that are going on in society. And so, you know, we talk openly about uh, what's happened at Wells Fargo, you know, over the last couple of years. And I always talk about, you know, they were giving products to people that didn't need them. And 200,000 people got their cars repoed because they get forced place insurance. Somebody in that team of people knew that wasn't right. And so to me, you have to have uh, the place where people can say, I know this isn't right. This doesn't feel right. We always talk about a progressive, when you're doing something, when you're having a debate, use the 60 minutes test. Can you be interviewed on 60 minutes and feel great about everything you're doing? And so I always say that, I'm like, if we're doing something new, to, new for a customer or even a, a new segmentation variable, because those can be sensitive, how would this feel if we're interviewed by 60 minutes? Um, what I've been talking about lately, both at home and, um, and at work the last couple of years, because I think of how people feel is, assume positive intent. If everybody assumes positive intent that we all are trying to do the right thing, then usually things go better. So we haven't had much of that at Progressive where there's debates. Now, we also, I also think it's everyone's right to have their own political views, and I really try not to bring those into, I really don't bring those into work because I think those can be, um, you know, it can be difficult because we have 34,000 people and they're a microcosm of America. So I know that there, there's different views. And so I really try to make it about our shareholders, our employees and the customers we're privileged to serve. And if we always use those three constituents, I think it works out. I think there was a question over here, or was I making that up? Hi, my name is Joseph. Uh, Hi, Joseph. I just wanted to ask you, we live in the 21st century, and the advent of new technologies, especially blockchain, what's your thoughts on like, these types of new technology, whether that be drone, chatbots, or especially like new like, blockchain technology, mm -hmm. kind of like, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to bring up Bitcoin, but like, what's your thoughts? On I should have been, I would have been richer. <laughs> like, what's your thoughts on 
how, like, as a CEO, what are you looking at in terms of like, new technology and what are you hoping to leverage? Yeah, I mean, I think we look at all this. So our, we have um, an IT uh, uh, architecture team that looks into all of those. So we are uh, deep into trying to understand blockchain and how we can work with that. We don't do anything with it right now, but we have people that are out and about trying to understand that, even in terms of cryptocurrency, because we have to be on top of, do people want to pay at some point, pay for their insurance like that. We, we know that people even now want to pay with Venmo. So when I think of different um, demographics, you know, how can you work, you know, work in terms of being able to um, meet the needs of all your customers? Uh, and I think from, uh, I talked about the chatbot. So we work closely with Snap and Facebook and Instagram and a lot of the companies, one, not just to market, but also to help us measure what people want to see and how they want to see it. It's, it's you know, for, from a, a marketing perspective, you can't take a 30-second commercial and make it to a 10-second Instagram. You know, it, it's very different. So we measure those things. So we're constantly understanding that. In terms of artificial intelligence and machine learning, we do that throughout the company um, all over. So we have a whole, um, a whole team of data scientists, but we also, for um, artificial intelligence, work on what we call um, chat for people that um, type in for common, common things. So there's 15 common reasons people type to, you know, want to chat with us. And it's usually something like, can I get another copy of my insurance card? And we would have people be answering the phone or people being chatting back. And we have that all automated by artificial intelligence. And even our, our algorithm in terms of, of when you're acquiring business on, on our direct channel, we have, um, we have what we call machine learning to have the best choice for you depending on your needs with coverage. So um, I would say, you know, we used to describe Progressive as a technology company that happens to sell auto insurance. And I think we still try to be innovative and it's hard because it's constant, um, but we really try to test, we trust to learn constantly. Thank you, good question. Hi, I'm Hi. Hi. I just have a question about like, if you have any advice for students trying to find like, an internship or a job. Yeah, I mean, you know, the unemployment rate's the lowest it's been, um, but I think there's a, a fair amount of opportunities out there if you, if you dig in. And I um, hate to say this, but if you, depending on what your needs are, um, how, you know, if, you, if, you, if it's for a money purpose, it's different than, hey, I want experience. So I think first you make that decision. Is it something I want experiential? I'm going through this with my son right now. Is it experiential or, is it, is, or do you, are you trying to make money? And then make the decision of, even if this isn't something completely relevant to what I want to do long term, will it give me skills for something else? So I would broaden, broaden your search. Uh, you know, I went right into retail and then I, you know, I didn't think uh, a claims rep, I'd want to be a claims rep. So be open, I would say, to um, all alternative types of interns. And I think just get your resume out there, get it out there quickly and follow up, follow up, um, uh, you know, and, and find the companies that, you know, give internships that you'd be interested in that works in your schedule. Hi. Um, Hi. As the leader of a publicly traded company, how do you balance um, kind of returns for shareholders uh, with the rest of the values that you mentioned? And then also, how do you deal with sort of the stress of the quick swings in your stock price? Do you deal with it all? Um, that's a great question. So I do really balance um, the, the ROE in terms of the three constituents I talk about. So, you know, we have shareholders and we know they demand a return uh, and, we, and we know approximately how much that will be and we're very open about that. So one of the things that we did several years ago, besides um, trying to make sure that, that our earnings per share continue to grow as we grow, which it has grown about 60% in the last year. So I think they're, they're pretty happy right now. But again, that can change in a moment. Um, don't look today, right now, I don't know what it is today. <laughs> um, uh, but we also, what we did was we aligned um, our incentive compensation for our employee base with our shareholders. So we have something called gain share. And on any given year, it can go from zero to two times what the factor is. And the factor is based on direct written premium written um, and our combined ratio. And so, and you get a different percentage depending on the job you have. 
we, what we do at the end of the year is we use a, per, or a certain percentage of 33 and a third percent of our after-tax underwriting profit and give that to investors. So it's called a variable dividend. So you can give a one-time dividend, but our dividend is known throughout the year if you're a shareholder. So you're going to, you'll be rewarded when we're rewarded as a company doing well. So we're all in this together. So to me, I think that's a really important and a very different way to look at dividends. And I think if you look at that, and we do, the only time we don't do it is in like in 2008, we didn't give one if our comprehensive income doesn't cover that. So when you, when you think about the investment income, when we lost money that year, we have a caveat that that doesn't make sense to give a dividend. Um, when you see companies, and you know, GE is a long-term company, but given dividends when they shouldn't be, when they've got other things to worry about, that to me doesn't make sense for a shareholder. So ours are really aligned with our shareholders. I'm also, I also really talk to our investors and shareholders uh, um, often. So next week I'll do uh, a webcast. I have a webcast where I'll do a topic, a certain deep dive topic of what we're doing, and they'll be able to ask questions. Um, but I think if you, um, you know, have the values, and that is grow, grow profitably, and do it in the right way, then good things come your way. But we were very aligned with our shareholders. And what was the other one? Stress of, oh, stock price. You know what? I, I can't be because there's days where you did nothing and it goes up and you did nothing and it goes down. So the stock price, I try not to look at it. I'm obviously a long-term long investor and I'm a customer and I'm an employee. So to me, it's like keep doing the right thing, grow the firm, and, um, and that's really my, my whole goal because if you, try, if you watch that, it will drive you crazy. So I've, I've tried really hard not to do that. He has a question. <laughs> He's been very patient too. Am I? Is that the final one, Liz? Liz, my okay. I'm getting yelled at. Um, how do you see the increase of AI vehicles on the road changing the insurance landscape? Maybe not over the next five years, but like ten. Years. That's a great question. Um, you know, the frequency of accidents has gone down pretty much the last 50 years. It's been offset a little bit by severity of whether it's healthcare costs or um, repairing vehicles. Um, if you read the Wall Street Journal every day, you think autonomous cars will be here tomorrow. I do not believe that. But any CEO of insurance companies that aren't thinking about that aren't doing their job. So for me, I think about it in terms of right now, I want most of the company to be thinking about executing on our current plan and continuing to capture more of the market share. Um, and then I think of it as kind of the, the, next, um, uh, the next portfolio would be to expand adjacencies, things we're good at. So we know we're good at our brand, our analytics, our service. So what are things we can develop here um, that are a little bit different? So we're working on things like small business insurance direct and some other, some other um, things that will be coming in the next couple of years. And then the third horizon I think of as explore. What are we doing now to invest in a portfolio of items that will replace that revenue? Knowing that there will be cars, even if there's not cars, you know, in 20 years all drive themselves, there's going to be substantially less accidents, which is great for society. So for me to have an enduring business 80 years from now, we're 81 years old, what am I doing for that portfolio? So I have a strategy team and we're working on figuring out the right investments and we know some won't work to, re to um, reproduce that revenue. And the assumption I had the team going in was pretend there's autonomous cars and there's very few accidents, what, what would we sell? What would we do? How could we leverage um, our skills and our expertise? So I think you've got to be thinking across everything. I don't want to miss out on the opportunities. You heard the growth I had, we've, we've had in the last couple of years. I want to continue with that. But you've got to be thinking about plan A, B, C. And for me, it's my role to be able to set uh, the company up for the next CEO and hand it over to them like Glenn did for me with lots of opportunities. So um, I do think if I had to bet, and this is my, just uh, me personally, it will happen more quickly with TNCs, with Uber and Lyft, and with commercial, because then you've got the labor as well. So I think that's where it'll happen first. You can see platooning on the roads. Um, and then, you know, we've got a lot of infrastructure things to work out, but it, it'll come. I, I'm, not, I'm not being naive. You've got to be planful about it and not miss out on opportunities right in front of you. Really good question. Well, we're out of time. Uh, thank you again. I can't tell you how much fun this was and um, just fun being back, uh, back in Redbird territory. I appreciate it. Thanks for all you do and uh, good luck in your endeavors.